Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for connecting to today's class. And uh, really happy that um, uh, many of you are continuing into your third year. So this is a special year, final year. And you've made uh, the journey so far. Congratulations on that. It's not easy to get till here. And I uh, just want to encourage us. The third year uh, will be a little bit more intense and uh, challenging in terms of uh, content which is going to be taught to us. Uh, but want to uh, really encourage you to put in that kind of effort, make use of whatever is being taught. And uh, uh, yeah, want to see all of you on graduation day uh, and uh, rejoice with you. Uh, not very far, actually. So uh, just around the corner. So thank you, all the on-campus students as well as the online students. Um, uh, please continue and uh, please uh, make sure that you're fulfilling all the requirements for the course completion. Let's pray and uh, we'll, we will begin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, it's your strength, your grace, your faithfulness that has carried us thus far. And Lord, your word exhorts us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father God, enable us, Lord, yeah, even as we um, make this effort that uh, we will grow deeper in your word, Lord. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for the book of Acts that we are going to study. Thank you uh, uh, for displaying your power in such a glorious way in the early church, Father God. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, with everything that we discuss, our hearts will be inspired and impacted uh, to live that purpose that you have called each one of us to. We praise you and worship you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, we will get into our um, study. So for the book of Acts, what we generally uh, do is... Um, we used to read through the book of Acts, you know, verse by verse. Uh, but this year, we'll probably do it a little bit differently. I'll request us to read and come. So you can read and come uh, one or two chapters at a time. And then we can discuss through it. Today, uh, most likely, we may touch upon Acts chapter 1. I'll start with an introduction today. And then uh, we will also get into Acts chapter 1. We'll see how far we can complete Acts chapter 1. So for the study, we generally use um, the NKJV version. So if you have um, that version of the Bible, you can follow along. Apart from that, uh, there is a good, um, I, I would say, uh, assessment of uh, what's happening in the book of Acts in uh, one of our one of our APC publications, Revivals, Visitations, and Moves of God. So you can download a copy of that uh, book. You will see that there is a lesson uh, or a chapter on the revival in the Book of Acts. And very systematically, uh, Pastor Ashish has written about uh, uh, what is happening in uh, different parts of this book. So that is helpful in understanding the Book of Acts. And right now at uh, All People's Church, we are doing a series uh, of sermons on the Book of Acts. So that also is very helpful. Um, we have uh, a really good uh, description along with uh, there are pictures, there are maps. Uh, so uh, that sort of brings the whole story alive for us. So today we will begin with Acts chapter 1. Uh, and uh, just for our convenience, I have posted uh, the link to one of the commentaries. The uh, commentary is David Guzik's um, Enduring Word. Enduring Word. So uh, what I'm going to share from here is going to be a mix of David Guzik and uh, the APC resources. Um, so uh, you know, if you're tracking with me through one of the PDFs, uh, you may feel like, oh, OK, I'm not sticking to that text because I'm, I'm trying to combine the information from all these places and uh, share with us. So let's start with uh, Acts chapter 1 here. Uh, we know that the book of Acts um, came about after the ascension of our Lord Jesus. In fact, Acts chapter 1 has uh, 
a mention of the ascension of Jesus Christ. So the timeline when the book of Acts took place is between AD 30 to AD 70. Um, and, you know, we, we will see that um, in these 40 years, there's a lot that took place in Jerusalem and in the neighboring regions. We especially see a, a, a very powerful event in church history, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. This is a promise that Jesus made. And also we find promises in the Old Testament where God said that he would pour out his spirit. And when he does pour out his spirit, um, that the disciples would become witnesses. They would become witnesses in Judea, Samaria, firstly in Jerusalem where they are and to the neighboring parts and to the ends of the earth. So that's exactly what we see from AD 30 to AD 70, 40 years. Uh, okay. So uh, this account of all the things that took place was written by Luke. Luke, um, we know, is uh, likely a Greek uh, individual who lived in the city of uh, Antioch in Syria. And uh, Luke is a doctor or a physician by profession. So in the writings of Luke, we would see that he's rather systematic. He's very, um, uh, uh, very detailed in his, his understanding and his reporting of the many incidents that took place. Uh, and also, we recognize that um, uh, he is someone who has understood the, the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. So he's written the book of Luke, where he has talked in detail about the life of Jesus, the sermons that Jesus preached, and also, um, you know, the, the uh, incidents that took place in his life, how he was put under trial, his death, his resurrection, and all of that. And um, this book of the Acts of the Apostles is considered a um, sequel or continuation. So first Luke wrote the book of Luke and then he the book of Acts. Okay, And um, it's really helpful because the work that he has done is quite thorough and uh, quite detailed. In some portions of the book of Acts, we may also see that um, he uses the term we, so we set, we set sail, we went. So that means he was very much a part of the travel or the journey along with Apostle Paul. So he participated in uh, the missionary work that took place in these 40 years. So that's another advantage because he is writing an eyewitness account of the things that took place. So a little bit more about the Book of Acts. Um, as we already stated, it's um, uh, it's written by Luke. We have the Gospels and then we have the Book of Acts. Um, the progression is from the ministry of Jesus, his ascension to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the early church. So it's almost like it's a bridge between the uh, Gospels and the epistles. So imagine if there was no book of Acts, if we went straight from the Gospels to the epistles, we'll all be clueless. We'll be like, okay, what's happening? Uh, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Who is Paul? What is his life all about? How is he writing to these people in different cities? So there are many key incidents that we would miss out if the book of Acts was not there. So we can also say that the book of Acts is like a bridge. It's a bridge. It gives us some context when we study the epistles. Uh, we've already seen regarding Luke um, that uh, he's a physician. He was part of the Gentile church in the uh, in Antioch of Syria. Uh, we could also say that you know he's a teacher and a historian. Now, this book, 
is being written to a man by the name of Theophilus. Okay, we'll see as we get into uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. He starts by addressing a man called Theophilus, who is likely to be a believer, but maybe a top ranking official. So there are people who state that uh, Luke wrote a detailed letter to uh, officials because he was writing a case or something to defend Paul. Yeah, you know, as we go through the book of Acts, we will see that at one point, Paul was standing before governors and uh, kings and trying to defend himself. Uh, so Luke may have written about the life of Paul more in detail in the book of Acts as a defense letter. That's why there is so much focus on Paul in the book of Acts. Okay, so and why is he writing to Theophilus? So some commentators say that uh, maybe because you know the officials they needed uh, this document in order to defend Paul. So that is a thought uh, process that uh, some people employ. Um, so this whole writing of the Book of Acts was supposed to help Paul defend himself um, before Nero. Nero is um, is the uh, highest authority, you know, the Roman authority that uh, eventually Paul would have to face. And so that's the reason uh, Luke wrote it. What are some of the some of the uh, major themes that we notice in the book of Acts? We will see that the first part uh, talks about the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, and uh, the birth of the church. And later, the focus moves to Apostle Paul. So that is there in the book of Acts. What else are we going to see in the book of Acts? We'll see a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a move of the people from one central location outwards. So there's a spread of the gospel. There's a spread of uh, taking the truth about Jesus Christ from where the disciples were to the nearby cities, region, and even an attempt to move into other continents. So you could say that uh, what Jesus says in Acts 1.8, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that is being fulfilled in the book of Acts. So geographically, we will see an expansion. Okay. So first I said that we would see uh, the first portion of Acts more about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the growth of the church, second part about Apostle Paul and his ministry. The next thing that we stated is geography. We'll see the church moving out. And uh, this will not just happen through a few people, a few key leaders, but several others uh, start getting a mention. Initially, it's the apostles in the church of Jerusalem. And suddenly, Acts chapter 8, you'll see a man by the name of Philip. He is a volunteer in the church, but he moves to Samaria and he preaches the gospel there. And then, you know, uh, you'll see Peter, he moves into Judea, he starts doing the work. And then you hear names like Antioch of Syria, and then Paul is moving in, right, from uh, the Asia Minor region into the Europe region. So geographically, there is an expansion. What else can we see here? We see that uh, there are different ethnic groups and communities that get impacted as the work begins. In the beginning, in Jerusalem, we find that uh, the ministry was happening mainly to the Jews. So uh, Peter and John, they were ministering to the Jews. And uh, Peter was very passionate about ministering to the Jews. Later on, slowly we see a shift uh, when the ministry moves to places like Samaria and uh, regions in Judea. We find that uh, Samaritans start giving their lives to Christ. Now, they have a different background 
So this community of Samaritans has a different background. They are a mixed, sort of a mixed race. Okay, so um, the gospel is going out. And then you find an Ethiopian eunuch. He's not a part of the, uh, uh, you know, like the Jewish community of Jerusalem, but it's moving out to other communities. We'll also find that there are Gentiles from the time God calls Peter, come and speak to Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile. So the gospel will move to Gentiles. And, um, you know, eventually it just moves to other parts of the world where all kinds of people, Jewish, uh, Gentile, you know, uh, if, if you find other communities, it's going to other communities as well. So just the way we saw an expansion in geography, we find uh, an expansion across cultures, across ethnic groups. Uh, and the gospel, literally, how we uh, read about it in John chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world. So it's going to the world starting from the book of Acts. Okay, so that's again very, very inspiring and interesting uh, in the book of Acts. So as we look at this book, you know, how is it written? It's written in a storytelling uh, format where uh, we find a lot of descriptive language. We find that um, uh, it's also historical because it records incidents that took place uh, over um, a, a certain timeline. Uh, we said 40 years, right? AD 30 roughly to AD 70, uh, different incidents took place. And we would find in this uh, passage uh, at least 18 different sermons, sermons that are being spoken by different men and women. Uh, and uh, there, there is... Uh, theological message being preached to the church, being preached to uh, the community that does not know Christ yet. Uh, and we, we see that the key of all the messages that are being preached uh, uh, is that the Lord Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And uh, also we'll find that uh, people like Peter, when they're preaching, or Paul, when he's preaching, they bring out Old Testament scriptures uh, to state that God has fulfilled. Whatever he has promised, he has fulfilled. So uh, these are, again, some of the things that we could note in the book of Acts. Okay. So uh, now we'll step into Acts chapter 1. We've seen a very brief um, description. So as we get into Acts chapter 1, we see an introduction. You know, Luke is writing to Theophilus. Uh, and uh, we will see how the Lord Jesus encourages the disciples uh, because now he will go away. He'll ascend, and then they are the ones who will be left behind to do the work that he has called them to do. He's already prepared them, but you know, even then their hearts were discouraged. So he encourages them, and we'll see how the uh, disciples they waited in the upper room for the promise which was given to them, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And finally, we'll see that um, because now there are only eleven of the disciples left, the ones that were um, trained by Jesus. Judas Iscariot has already betrayed Jesus. So they do um, a selecting of the 12th disciple. So these are the sections that we are going to cover, right? Introduction to um, Theophilus. And then we see Jesus encouraging the believers. And uh, after that, we are going to see uh, Jesus telling them that he will ascend into heaven, he will pour out the spirit, uh, the disciples waiting in prayer in the upper room, and uh, finally the selection of the 12th disciple. So this, this is the content that chapter 1 covers. So let's uh, get into chapter 1 for now. Okay, so uh, before we uh, get into chapter one, just one more um, 
important section of information is in these 40 years, right? So within the 40 years, uh, can we break it down further and uh, see what and all happened? So let's break it down. AD 30 to 38, first eight years is when a spirit-filled community of believers is established in Jerusalem. You know, we call it the Church of Jerusalem. So first eight years is more about the Church of Jerusalem. The next 10 years, the next 10 years, okay? So this would be from Acts chapter 8 to Acts chapter 12 um, is where we see the work multiplying and going into other cities and regions and the establishing of believing communities in these places. So Acts chapter 8 to 12. But it's almost 10 years, Acts chapter 8 to 12. It's uh, really uh, interesting that within those few chapters, so many years have actually passed. So much God has done. So 8 to 12 is 10 years duration of time. From Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13 is when the Holy Spirit says, uh, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry for which I have called them. From 13 to the end of the book of Acts, Acts 28, it's 20 years. Okay, So 20 years. That's how we are going to understand all the things that are taking place. Okay, so we've seen the timeline. So we divide it into the initial eight years and then the next 10 years and the following 20 years. The focus in the last 20 years is, of course, Apostle Paul. But overall, overall, you know, in, in what is happening, uh, we've seen that there is a picture of a church that emerges in the book of Acts, uh, which we can call as the DNA of the church. Okay, reason is what a spirit-filled church should look like uh, is the picture that the early church gave us. Because, you know, there was uh, dedication to the word of God. There was dedication to, to experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit and fulfilling the Great Commission. So they were on fire. You know, many times that's the best way to describe the book of Acts. They were on fire for God. Whatever God has commanded us right, to be like, to be devoted to the word, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to take the gospel out and, you know, many other aspects. They began with all those things and they gave us a pattern. Of course, there were challenges in the early church. We will come across those challenges as we uh, study. Uh, but thankfully, we also find that the apostles were there to guide the church, instruct the church and take the work forward. So now let's continue with our um, study from Acts chapter 1. So as we stated, uh, the writing of this book was to an individual called as Theophilus, who seems to have a Roman name. And therefore, we can say that he was a Roman believer who uh, had authority. Theophilus. Okay, Theophilus. Uh, this, this name, Theo is God and Phyllis is love. So lover of God. Okay, it's a really nice name. Theo Phyllis, that was his name. Lover of God. And Luke wrote to this Roman believer uh, the account that took place after the ascension of Jesus. Now in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, I'm just touching on the highlights. You know, earlier we used to read through uh, in the earlier batches that we did, but I, I think we won't do that this time. Uh, we'll just look at some of the key highlights. Verse 3 here of Acts chapter 1, uh, we'll just quickly go to it. There it says, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, 
and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So it tells us that once Jesus resurrected, he was um, physic. Uh, I mean, he was seen by people. So for forty days, it says, forty days speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus was still around after his resurrection. It's not like he came and he just disappeared. For forty days, he was with the disciples, speaking to them about what. See, Luke does not leave us in confusion. Jesus was speaking after his resurrection. Must have been something important that he was speaking to the disciples. And what was the theme? Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. He didn't come up with something different, something um, you know unknown. So that we must remember, uh, because there are people who come up with false teaching, and they say the resurrected Jesus preached this and that. This is a secret message. This is an unknown message, special message. We don't go by all those things because Luke says when Jesus, uh, the resurrected Christ, was among his disciples, he preached pertaining the kingdom of God. Okay, so it's quite clear for us. We won't go by stories that people tell us. So forty days, forty days. Again, this is important for us because when did Jesus die? What what was happening in Jerusalem at that time? Uh, Passover, Passover. Okay, and when did the Holy Spirit? When was the Holy Spirit poured out? Pentecost. So between Pentecost and Passover are fifty days. Fifty days. Okay. So then it gives us an understanding. Okay, Jesus died. He was resurrected. Forty days he was there. And the disciples will now wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So roughly ten days they waited in Jerusalem, and then the Holy Spirit was poured out. Okay, so this is what the timeline looks like. And in this verse three, again we see infallible proofs. He gave many proofs to the people. In First Corinthians chapter fifteen and verse six. Uh, we notice that about five hundred people saw the resurrected Jesus. It's historical. It's historical. There could there are extra biblical writings where uh, people have talked about the resurrected Jesus. So why are we saying this? You know, we do apologetics. We talk about uh, uh, the accuracy of scripture, the reliability of scripture. Now, the life of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is historical; it's not mythological. So there are uh, biblical writings as well as extra biblical writings that help us affirm that Jesus is real. Okay, he existed and he did what the Bible says he did. What about the resurrected Jesus? The Bible says at least five hundred people have seen him. So it's not mythological. There are people who have experienced; they've seen him, and um, uh, they've shared about him. So, forty days he was with the people, and we are told that he gave infallible proofs that he's alive. Now, what are all these infallible proofs? We don't have a full list of the things that he did, but I'm sure he did many things, and people were hundred percent clear that Jesus is now alive. So, he was alive. He was walking with the people, and he preached about the kingdom of God. Okay, um, so that tells us that how important this subject is to the heart of God, the kingdom of God. He could have talked about anything, but he spoke about the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the rule and reign of our God. The kingdom of God is the rule and reign of the power of God. Okay, uh, the kingdom of God is how um, the the virtues of the kingdom invade everything. You know, uh, righteousness, peace, joy, uh, the presence of God, truth, many things. How this kingdom rules and reigns. That's what Jesus was talking about. It's very powerful. And so today, when we preach, sometimes we preach kingdom of God, kingdom of God, 
repetitively it's okay to preach uh, you know a message that already existed because even jesus see jesus is the living word himself he could have come up with a new message because anything he says will become the word isn't it he is the word uh, he is the word that became flesh but jesus is respecting and honoring the truth that has already been proclaimed i'm sure there would have been depth added to what he was teaching but he's upholding uh, scriptures he's upholding the truth that has already been proclaimed that shows us how much more we have to honor when jesus is honoring the truth about the kingdom we also have to honor the truth about the kingdom so that's what he preached then what else he gave a very very important message to the disciples we will see the we will see that in verse 5 and verse 8 so uh, could uh, anyone please read verse 5 and verse 8 please was 5 and uh, so john truly baptized with the water but you shall be baptized with the holy spirit not many days from now therefore when they had come together they asked him saying lord will you eat this time restore the kingdom of israel five yeah go ahead okay Yes, yeah, okay. You read the whole thing. No problem. Six. And he's uh, yes. Therefore, therefore, when this uh, had come together, they asked him, saying, "Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel?" And he said to them, "It is not for you to know times of seasons, which the Father has put in His own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit Spirit has come upon you, and you shall." witnesses to me in jerusalem and in judea and samaria and to the end of the earth all right thank you nikhil so we look at uh, these uh, four verses and stop for today so what jesus is telling them is that there is a baptism in water john baptized you with water but meaning there's a different baptism that he wants to talk about now so there is another baptism also the baptism in water is there and it is very much valid jesus is upholding that and then he's saying but you shall be baptized with the holy spirit not many days from now remember we said 40 days and then the 10 days of waiting and then it happened so there is another baptism which will happen and uh, the believer must experience that baptism and verse 8 he says but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in jerusalem and in all judea and samaria and to the end of the earth so he's also telling them why they need this baptism okay uh it is good for us to be baptized in water because that's a command from god and that's the right thing to do to fulfill all righteousness but for us to be effective witnesses for christ you know that word witness you shall be my witness if you go back and check it out in the greek language it's uh, the word martus okay so what does that mean it means a martyr or it does, it we shouldn't take it as okay everyone who is going to witness for christ is going to become a martyr it's not like that but in terms of our commitment to god in terms of the way we are, we are going to represent christ you know many times people use sold out sold out for christ something like that you shall be my witnesses so to be a powerful witness for christ we need the baptism in the holy spirit and that's what jesus is telling them you will receive power from on high when the holy spirit has come upon you and it will help you become a powerful witness everywhere where you are living to your neighbors to the nations it's amazing like you can you and i can be witnesses like that to our homes our family members uh, people who watch us who live around us and the nations but for that we need the holy spirit you know somebody described it like this we can be a witness for christ without baptism in the holy spirit um, but we can be a powerful witness for christ 
with baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, if you just take, for example, uh, it, it's just a, uh, you know, like if we have to clean this room, okay, and uh, I begin to broom it with my energy, it'll take some time, let's say five minutes, right? But if I use a gadget, which is powered by electricity, how much time do you think it'll take? It'll take a minute or two, like quickly. Okay, so similarly, like if there's a field and uh, I want to um, uh, cut out all the um, uh, harvest, if I do it physically, it takes a long time. But if I use, you know, a tractor, a machine, what happens? Quickly, you're done. So there is power in both these cases. We're using a gadget with power. So it's just like for us to understand the work that God is calling us to do, it takes power. And we need his power. Yeah, we can do it to an extent. Can a person who is not baptized with the Holy Spirit be a witness? Of course, can be a witness. But if we need to be the kind of witness that Jesus wants us to be, we need power. We need power. And God is saying, I want to give you that power. You take the power and you do my work. You shall be my witnesses where you are and to the ends of the earth. And just one more thought in this section that we read. Look at it the uh, disciples okay they are asking jesus and jesus is talking important things they are talking unimportant things they're saying lord at will you at this time restore the kingdom to israel they're only thinking about literal things as if jesus is the king and he's going to restore the kingdom and jesus says look you listen to me what i'm trying to tell you because their attention is somewhere else unimportant and you know, he tells them, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Meaning, there are certain things that you don't have to worry about. It, let God be God. Let him do what he wants to do. The things that God is calling us to do, give your attention to that. So, I guess it happens to us also. God is saying something important. We are saying something unimportant. And God says, okay, relax. Give your attention to the important things. Okay, so let's stop here and we will pick it up uh, in the next class. Uh, let's pray and we, we shall wrap up. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the first class of the Book of Acts. And we believe that even as we are going to uh, take time to study it, uh, that, Lord, uh, our lives will be transformed by uh, the revelation, O oh God, of what you're bringing to us. We thank you once again. We bless you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you and God bless you, everyone. Um, uh, we'll meet on Friday. So Friday is our next class. We will meet on Friday. Thank you.